Good evening. Uh, we are moving through Holy Week. This is not one of the more joyful services. You know, we got together on Ash Wednesday and talked about how difficult it was to uh, face the fact that we're sinners in need of a Savior. This is the service where we focus on the cross. I, I don't know if you're anything like me, but uh, I spend this time, the, these days before, and I accumulate on DVR all the old movies, King of Kings and Greatest Story Ever Told, and watch those things. And tonight, we will really live. We're going to have some people to do some reading. Uh, we're going to have uh, one of the characters of the Passion. And uh, so we will, uh, tonight, just focus on the cross. Um, let us begin with our liturgy. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Let's pray together. Almighty God, your son Jesus Christ was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we who glory in his death for our salvation may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have some men that are going to be reading for us tonight. Back when I was in seminary, they talked about something called the pious movement. People would sit together and read scripture to one another. So before we do anything else with the story, we're going to hear the story, four gentlemen, and they'll take turns reading to the story from, from John. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So J Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. I do not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, 
Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which, father, which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Judean authorities seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Anas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the religious authorities that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus while Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman who guarded the gate said to Peter, Are not you also one of the man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in temple, where all Jewish people come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him abound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, are you, all, are you also one of his disciples? He denied it and says, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of man who, well, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Capias to Pilate's headquarters. It was early. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you have or do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The religious authority said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This is to fulfill the world which Jesus has spoken, to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answers, I am a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answers, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were this world, my servants would fight, that I may not be handed over to the religious authorities. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You said that I'm a king. For this I was born, for this I have come into this world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is in the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went to the religious authorities and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man from you at Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of Jews? They cried out again. Not this man, Bar 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 Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then, then Pilate took Jesus and scroused him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you, that you might know I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself, crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The religious authorities answered him, We have a law, and by the law he ought to die. 
because he had, he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me unless you have been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivers me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the religious authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat him down in the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the religious authorities, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and went out, bearing his own cross to the place called called the place of skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read the title, and place that where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The Jewish chief priest then said to Pot, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers crucified Jesus. They took his garment, made four parts, one, on each, one for each soldier, also the tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from the top to the bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lot to see whose it shall be. This will fulfill the scripture. They parted my garment, and among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Calops, Calpas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples with whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And when he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from this hour, the disciple took her to his own house. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl of vinegar, a bowl full of vinegar stood there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on a hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the spirit. It has been our tradition to uh read uh, little parts of scripture and then to see that scripture acted out and uh, we're going to be in uh, Mark and this is really toward the end of, uh, of the passion event and there is someone who is, has observed that and, and hear, hear these words from Mark and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and when the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Jesus, I had, I had heard that name, but had never seen the man, knew little of him, until he was delivered to me by his own people to be crucified. We took him and we beat him. We placed a crown of thorns upon his head. He never cursed us. He never cried out. He only asked 
that we be forgiven. I knew then that there was something different about this. This was a righteous man. We took him and we gave him the cross and told him to go up the hill. He took it, never crying out, never wanting help. And when we got him there, we laid him upon the cross. We drove nails in his feet and in his hands. People cursed him, and yet he never cried out. He never cursed us. And then we picked up the cross and we dropped it with a thud into the hole, tearing holes in his hands. Only a few hours did he hang there, and when he died, there was an earthquake and it got dark. The curtain in the temple tore apart. As I looked upon him, I knew this was truly the Son of God. What has been amazing to me as I have worked through a series is that we see the story of the cross, even in the Old Testament, even in the Psalms. We are in Psalm 22. You know this psalm for a different verse, but we're going to read some verses, and you can see the story within this, uh, this psalm that was written hundreds of years before the event. It says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou dost lay me in the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are on this night focusing on the cross. As I come into this season, I begin to feel convicted. We probably should focus on the cross a lot more all during the year. A story that I found was this. You may know the name Tim LaHaye. And uh, he was one of the writers of the Left Behind series. And according to the story, he was working on a book, and the book was called The Power of the Cross. And, and he intended to do this. As part of the book, you know, he had gone around and seen so many women who had necklaces and jewelry all with the cross. And, and so he's going to ask the question, why are you wearing that? He, he, he asked him two questions. Why do you wear the cross and what does it mean to you? Now, you'll be glad to know that there were some women who really were Christians. And they said, I wear the cross. This is my witness. This is my reminder of what Jesus did for me. And, and that's wonderful. But he was surprised at some of the other answers. Uh, there's one lady, she said, I saw it in the display case and it just looked really attractive. There was another lady, she said, I bought it because it was marked 50% off. There was another lady, and she said, well, I don't go to church but Christmas and Easter, but I really do consider myself a Christian. And there was another lady, and she had a cross around her neck. She said, my boyfriend gave this to me, and every time I wear it, I think about my boyfriend. And there was a lady in a, in a computer store, and, and she said she wouldn't go anywhere without it. She said, this is my book, good luck piece. And, and so, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross but maybe not for all the right reasons. We read today from Psalm 22. There's a verse that you probably know better. The opening verse of Psalm 22, and it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, you may be familiar with this because of cantatas that have been written, sermon series called The Last Seven Words of Jesus. And, and one of those words actually came from, uh, from Psalms. Jesus knew his Bible very well. Uh, here was a fully human Jesus dying on a real cross, experiencing as much pain and humility as anyone could ever experience. The psalmist, uh, before the event ever took place, pictured the event with graphic accuracy he talked about bones being poured out like water bones out of joint a heart that's turned to wax 
You know, there is a word in our English language that comes from the passion event. Have you ever used the word excruciating? And it comes out of the word crucifixion. Crucifixion, the most painful kind of way to die. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion, but they perfected it to make it the slowest, most painful, most humiliating death that you could ever die. Uh, some of you may have gone to see a movie called The Passion of the Christ, and I'm not sure if I could ever watch that movie again, but it depicted so much pain and so much suffering. Uh, you know, so many forms of suffering that Jesus had to overcome. Uh, the pain took place before the Romans ever even arrested Jesus. Jesus was in that garden, and we would have celebrated this last night. And as he's praying in the garden, drops of blood because there's so much anxiety, so much anticipation that Jesus experienced that. Uh, there comes the arrest, and not only the pain of the arrest, but the emotional pain. Here comes one of his own disciples who's going to come and put a kiss on him, and that's going to be how he's arrested. I read a book about how this arrest was done, and they said the Romans, even if they arrested, when they arrested somebody, did it in the most painful way. They would have taken his arm and jammed it up into the back to the point where they almost broke his arm. They would have taken their foot, stepped on his instep. He would have been in pain just from the fact of being arrested. Uh, before Jesus went to the cross, they flogged him. And you've probably seen depictions of this, how terrible it was. It wasn't just laying a whip on Jesus. The whip had many ends, and on each end of the whip, there was a piece of metal. And every time they would come across the back of Jesus, they would pull away parts of his flesh. Uh, and so here is the psalmist, and he's talking about this pain. He says, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I love to read the Psalms is David depicted all the emotions. David himself knew pain, knew humiliation. From Psalm 94, O God to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, judge of the earth. Render punishment to the proud Lord. How long will the wicked triumph? And again, from Psalm 22, it says, The onlookers, the gawkers, still gather round. So Jesus goes to the cross. And uh, Chuck described, and I'm just going to say some of the things that Chuck said, soldiers would have shoved Jesus onto the ground, onto the cross. They would have stretched his arms against the beams. One soldier would have pressed his knee against the forearm of Jesus, would have had a spike in his hand and a mallet in his hand. Jesus turned his head just in time to see the nail go through his hand. You remember a song that uh, I think we all know, he could have called 10,000 angels. Can you imagine that in that moment, wouldn't you want to cr cry out to God? And, and so that song says this, they bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. Upon his precious head, they laid a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. And so it, the moment wasn't aborted. And you heard the sound. The hammer hit the nail. And the nail goes into the hands of Jesus. The skin begins to rip. There is a little bit of blood at first, and then the blood begins to rush out. I have in a library a Max Licato book. It's called 316, and it's obviously based on John 316. And here's what Max Licato said. He said, at that point, when they were beginning to drive the nail, Jesus looked over to one side, and he saw the face of the man who was going to nail him to the cross. He saw the mallet, he saw the huge nail, uh, but he saw something else. Max Licato said, 
between his hand and the cross was a long, long list of every sin that you and I have ever committed. All of the sins, all the lust, all the lies, all the greedy moments, all the prodigal years, the bad decisions from last year, the bad attitudes of last week. Jesus saw the list and knew the list and paid the price. Jesus is on the cross. You know, a Roman could not be crucified uh, on the cross because uh, if you're a Roman citizen, that, they would never do that to you. Cicero, a Roman, said this. He said, let the very name of the cross be far away, not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts and his eyes and his ears. Jesus is bearing the sins of the world. He never lied, but he is being humiliated like someone who lied. He never cheated but he is bearing the embarrassment of a cheater while Jesus is on the cross. He is bearing the collective shame of all the world. One of the simplest verses of that day, Galatians uh, 3.13, and this is a modern version, it says this, it says, He changed places with us. You know, why is Good Friday, Good Friday, uh, you know, it had to be a terrible Friday for Jesus. But it is one of the best Fridays that you and I will ever experience. If somebody does something for me because I deserve it, I'm really proud of that. If somebody does something for me and I don't near deserve it, that is amazing. That is amazing grace. Is Jesus ever going to have to do this again? Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. So Jesus suffered and died so you and I can have eternal life. What's good about Good Friday? The fact that Jesus took our sin, our guilt, and it was nailed to the cross. This was not some last-minute thing. This has been planned from the beginning of time. Go back and read the prophets, and they tell the story as if they were right there. I, I hope you know Isaiah 53, and it's called The Suffering Servant. Let me read some of that. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. In there is that word despise. I hope you never despise somebody. It means that you treat them with the utmost contempt. Jesus was so despised by the religious rulers of the day, they didn't even bother to give him a fair trial. He was so despised by the soldiers who flogged him and who crucified him that they spit on him, they put a robe on him, they put a crown of thorns on him, and he was rejected. All those people who saw but didn't believe that he was the Son of God. You know, every time we turn from him, it's a form of rejection. There's a song I remember that says, does he still feel the nails every time I fail? And you remember the story. The story was that Jesus wasn't by himself. There were two thieves, one on either side, and one of the thieves was kind of arrogant, and, and he said, hey, save yourself and us. And the other thief somehow saw who Jesus really was. And he said, you know, this man has done nothing. And he turned to Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. There's a book I have called The Anthology of the Cross. And I want to end with this statement this man made. It says, Jesus does not reject any who would turn to him. At times we turn to him with very little faith. 
at times there's a, a, a mixture of faith and doubt. Jesus isn't fastidious about the quality of our faith. He takes what we give him, and he gives immeasurably more than what he receives. His response to our faith is so much greater than our faith. Let's pray, and then we're going to have a time, and I'll talk about meditating on the cross. Father, we come tonight, and uh, we just hear the story again uh, about your son who was willing to go to the cross for our sins, something we didn't deserve, but something he did, something we can so easily receive and, and live into. And so, Father, us, and we are going to uh, come forward if you choose, uh, touch the cross, kneel, and just meditate on the cross, and, and we'll do that now.